And now that I know how to use this vertical mouse. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. We're just gonna give everyone a moment to join us uh, and then we will get started. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Trying to get my mouse uh, situated. Okay, there we go. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Anna Greco. I am the Director of Education at the Greenwich Historical Society. And I just want to thank you for joining us for tonight's program, uh, Hangroot, the Early Native and African Presence in Greenwich, Connecticut with Teresa Vega. Uh, Teresa will be giving her presentation in a webinar format. And what that means is you'll see us speakers as well as the presentation. And if you have a question, we ask that you will submit it uh, through the Q&A. So right at the bottom of your screen, there is a little talk box icon with Q&A. If you click on that, a window will pop up and you can submit your questions there. So we will have a little time at the end and we will try to address as many as we can after, after the lecture. Um, I would like to start this evening by acknowledging that I am speaking to you on what was once Wetchisqueak land. I'm currently in Norwalk, Connecticut, uh, which is a Wetchisqueak name. And their territory included the land reaching down through Greenwich into Westchester County and the Bronx. Uh, the Wet'suwet'en were a Muncie Algonquin speaking Lenape people. In tonight's program, Teresa Vega will discuss the early Native and African American presence in Greenwich, Connecticut that predates the founding of the town. She will also talk about the rise and decline of Hangroot, an integrated community that grew around the intersection of Round Hill Road and Horse Neck Brook and her extended family's fight to save their colored cemetery in the Byram section of town. Teresa Vega has been researching her family history and genealogy for almost 20 years. In 2010, she began using a combination of traditional genealogy and genetic genealogy, and has been able to trace several of her maternal mixed race lines to colonial New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Virginia. It's her goal to be able to document her family's history uh, in the way that it was experienced by her ancestors. And her research specialties include African American and Puerto Rican genealogy, slavery and free blacks in the Northeast, the Afro-Dutch cultural legacy in New York and New Jersey, the New York Madagascar slave trade in the late 1600 and early 1700s, the historical importance of African American burial grounds, as well as genetic genealogy for beginners. She is in the process of writing her first two books, The DNA Trail from Madagascar to the World and Hangroot, an early Native and African American community, and I cannot wait to read both, read both of them. She has bachelor's degrees in anthropology and Asian studies from Bowdoin College and has previously worked as an adjunct professor in cultural anthropology while attending Cooney Graduate School and Uni University Center's doctoral program in anthropology. She shares her research on her blog www.radiantrootsinboracuabranches.com. She is a proud member of the New Jersey and New York chapters of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogy Society and is a, pro, a Black pro-gen live panelist. She sits on the board of the Rye Historical Society and their programs committee. She has been a co-administrator for Family Tree DNA's Malagasy Roots Project with C.C. Moore of PBS's Finding Your Roots in DNA Detective since 2014. And she gives talks about her research throughout the tri-state area. 
We are happy to have you join us, Ter Teresa. It is always a pleasure um, to hear about your research and your insights for the history of Greenwich. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I want to thank everybody else for um, allowing me this opportunity to speak. Uh, my friends at the Greenwich Historical Society, I have many uh, family and friends who are joining um, this webinar. Um, I, before we go, I'd like to state that I will be passing out or, or handing out um, the PowerPoint presentations in case I go too quickly because we have time constraints. Uh, and also two handouts. One has to do with the source uh, information um, and my blog post information for the individuals that we discuss. Um, when I say we, my cousin Andrea and I as well as a reading list that details um, slavery in the North for the most part. So uh, let us begin. Uh, Hang group, the early Native and African-American presence in Greenwich. Uh, this picture here was taken in the 18, uh, I think in the 1890s, I believe, of um, Samuel Merritt and his uh, descendants. If you look on in the picture on the upper, uh, right, you'll see individuals looking down, and that was about Teresa, the time. Mm -hmm. my apologies. Um, you need to share your screen with us. Oh, that would help, right? Okay, let me uh, do this. I don't know why. Uh, let me see. Well, how come it's not sharing? Um, I thought it was. Let me end the slideshow and then come back in. Hold on. Are you still there? Are you, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, I'm doing it now. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to go in and do it now. Uh, let me see. Let me go to where I was. Uh, and I'm going to share. Let me go over here. Bear with me. I'm not a pro on this. <laughs> you can still see me, right? Yes. Yeah. We okay, let me let me get to where the screen is. I'm looking for the, um, you're gonna have to help me out. And uh, let me see. Um, I'm trying to say, I don't see the main screen where I'm supposed to share it. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Just bear with me for a minute. Um, I'm going to move this out the way. Can you see it now? Yes. Are we good? There it goes. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm still trying to figure out the Zoom stuff. Okay, so let me start again. So this picture is of Samuel Merritt and uh, some of his uh, uh, family members around the 1890s. They were the last of our Lion Green Merritts to actually live in uh, Hangroot proper, Round Hill Road. And this was taken around the time that John Twachman, the artist, uh, bought um, the property of uh, their grandfather, my third great grandfather, um, Alan Green. And of course, uh, he's the green in the green Twachman house. So let us begin. Uh, when I first started detailing the history of my uh, family, uh, one of the things we had to do was, you know, in, in looking at who they were living next to in the, in the larger black community was I had to define what was hang root. Okay, what were the perimeters um, of hang root, uh, what was the geographical area? Because this was the area where a majority of your African American uh, and Native American folks lived. So the borders would be your northern border would be Clap uh, Clapbridge Road, I think it, I believe it, Clapboard Ridge Road. Your eastern border is Pexlin Avenue. Western border is Lake Avenue. Southern border would be Glenville Avenue. So that is the larger hang route of the early, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. And that particular area then becomes 
restricted to Round Hill Road that we know today. So that is the area that we will be discussing. Some of the facts about hang root. Hang root actually refers to the root cellars that existed in the area at that time. You had um, richer farmers who had these root cellars that they would stock with uh, fruits and vegetables to prevent the rodents from getting at them. And you would have um, poorer farmers visit those root cellars and, and be given access to the produce. It's first mentioned in 1737 when a bridge was built near Horse Neck Brook and Round Hill Road. And the picture I showed you of uh, Samuel Merritt, um, that brook is Horse Neck Brook. Um, prior to 1820 census, the following names were given to African and Native Americans. Okay, Negro, Indian, African. So, and I say that because if you're a descendant of enslaved and formerly enslaved people like myself, um, it can be very hard, you know, knowing and finding who your ancestors are if you don't know this. So when I put together the blog post on Hang Root, one of the first things I had to do was compare who is Negro in, you know, 1790. 1800, 1810, 1820, and then look for them in later years. Um, so you have my ancestor, Anthony Negro, in 1800. You have John Indian, guess where he was, what he was, Indian. Um, and you have, for example, Allie and Rachel African. And of course, Ali African, you know, we shall see, was born in Africa. Hang root Teresa, was. In, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to interrupt you again. Can you maximize your slides? For some reason, they're they're quite small. Okay, I thought it um, was maximized. Hold on. Um, let me see. <laughs> Not sure why. I I that's why I'm looking at because it looks like it's. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out how to do this on here. Okay, more. Um, do I need to hold on? Should I pause the sharing and then say? I'm not sure if there's, I'm, I'm so sorry, because I can't. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me end it and come back in. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I wonder if I can do it like, let me try it this way. Hold on. Let me see something for a minute if I can do it this way. Okay. Can you see that now or? We can see that. Um, Is that bigger? It's a little bit bigger. There's there's like a little presentation mode. Yeah, yeah, okay. Let me try that one. Let's not get hung on. We can share the slides af after the fact too, if it's Did, too difficult. So we can-, we can Do you wanna take it over from, is that easier? Um, we can try that, hold on. Okay. There we go. Oh, perfect. Can you just tell me when you want okay. to move forward. Keep going. Yeah, okay, stay here. So Hang Root was um, an integrated community. So there's no uh, all black area. Everything is integrated. And the population fluctuated. Um, if you look at uh, the number of enslaved individuals, 
in um, 1790, you're talking about 80, um, to a high of both uh, free and enslaved of 182 in 1850. And then that number decreases to just 53 individuals. Uh, the 53 are mostly the Greens and Merits are ancestors and collateral families by 1900. Next slide. Okay, most of your, this isn't true all the time, but it's true in the Greenwich and surrounding areas that most of your enslaved people and formerly enslaved people did actually take the name of their enslavers. And a majority of hang root residents were farmers, day laborers, stonemasons, coachmen, servants, domestics, factory mill workers, et cetera. Um, they were actually in that respect, no different from the, the folks who uh, lived in Greenwich at that time, majority population. Hang root residents were highly endogamous. And when I say endogamous, um, we often hear about, you know, white European endogamy. Oh, we're the descendants of the Mayflower, the Jamestown folks, et cetera. Well, uh, when you consider both Native and African American families in the colonial er era, they are likewise very endogamous. Um, there were so many laws on the books, black laws and black codes, I should say, that prescribed the interactions between um, people of color and the white majority population that prohibited uh, in law, not in practice, interracial relationships. However, we, we know that they did and they, they did occur. Um, but the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 contributed to this endogamy by forging family ties among the early Native and African American descendant populations within the tri-state area. So considering that formerly enslaved people were just one step above enslaved people, you have to look at the fact that families were still separated. Um, if you were formerly enslaved, AKA newly emancipated, you could not be a, a, a burden to the town in which you resided, okay? So you had to prove that you had employment. This resulted in uh, families being separated, wives only seeing their husbands certain times a year, et cetera, because people had to travel in order to work. Um, so if you are, are a formerly enslaved descendant like myself, and you're searching for your ancestors, you can't assume that you're gonna find them always in the place where they were born. They could have gone and we shall see many towns over, you know, maybe a different state. Uh, so when you consider that you have formerly enslaved people who's, who, who uh, of course they have to have papers, right? free papers, uh, are, how are they gonna be safe in a time when you have uh, kidnapping clubs around? So these folks forge ties and marriage alliances with other free and indigenous people in the area. And that's something that um, you shall see as we go on, next slide. Okay, we need to discuss this. Every time I see the word colored, I, because I'm a big Zora Neale uh, Hurston fan, and I keep thinking of her poem, What It Feels to Be a Colored Me. So what does colored mean? In the colonial era case, uh, colored um, can mean many things. It can mean that you're of African and European descent, you're Afro-Indigenous, you're Native, European, your mulatto or tri-racial and census records. But ultimately colored is a classification that results in paper genocide of indigenous people. 
Settler colonialism is responsible for the historic erasure of Native American ties to their own land. And I always say this, if you can call Native Americans anything but a child of God and Native American, then you can take their land and destroy their ties to the land. Um, and as an FYI, we'll discuss this later, but naming Byram Cemetery's Colored Cemetery as the Byram African-American Cemetery is and was an act of historic erasure. And that's coming from the perspective of the Lion Greens and Merits. Because, and you know, you're naming us a name that isn't a name that we would choose for ourselves. And you're erasing the historic significance of what colored, quote unquote, actually means. Next slide. Okay. This is Andrea, my uh, third cousin. We shared the same second set of great grandparents. Next slide. And I always do my research with her and everybody hears me talking about Andrea. So hopefully uh, one day soon we'll get to do a presentation together. Um, these are our second great grandparents. You have George E. Green, uh, born in Greenwich, who married Lauren Thompson. Um, she was born in Newark, but her ancestors came from Bergen County. I was one of the greatest finds of 2020 for Andrea and I um, was finding two runaway slave ads that indicated both of their one grandparent each were attempted to self emancipate themselves. So you have Anthony Green. Um, running away in 1811, and Laura Thompson's grandmother, my fourth great grandmother, Toon, um, who was born circa 1795 in Bergen County and was one of the last of 18 enslaved people to be freed by the Emancipation Proclamation in 1865. She passed away in 1881, and her roots were from Madagascar. Next slide. Okay, this is a brief overview of our line, the Lion Green Merits. And uh, I wrote the blog post to look at Northern slavery personified. So Peg Lion Green had two sons, two were by an enslaver, hence you, Nathan Merritt Jr. Um, we are pretty much certain based on um, DNA from uh, two of our, well, three of our merit on, on the Solomon merit line and uh, Pat and Eddie and their maternal aunt are listed. And that would be Charles Merritt and Jack Houston. Jack Houston was actually um, sold at the age of three to Simeon Lyon. And we later learned that he, uh, after Simeon died, he was raised by Benjamin Wolseley Lyon's daughter. And hence, uh, she had married at Houston and, and hence he took the name Houston. But Anthony Green Jr., Platt Green, Alan Green, my third great grandfather, Henry and Solomon were fathered by Anthony Green. Under gradual emancipation, all were freed between the, eight, the years 1816 and 1831. And the Lion Green merits are listed as early as 1810 as free blacks. However, Peg was emancipated in 1800. Um, Anthony wasn't technically emancipated until Captain John Green died in 1816. Three months after he died, uh, Mary Green, uh, his widow, uh, freed uh, Anthony. Next slide. Anthony Green was included in 1820 on a $5,000 uh, Landale. That would be like 111,000 and change Landale that moved his family from Byram, Glenville area to hang root uh, proper. Anthony was originally from uh, uh, Sherwoods Bridge, which is Glenville if you didn't know that. Uh, the Lion Green Merits were farmers who owned their own land. Their children were farmhands and uh, servants to the descendants of their former enslavers. 
And uh, the Thomas Lyon family has an over 350 plus year relationship with our Lyon Green Merritt family, which we now know is based on kin ties, blood ties. Peg died around 1830 and Anthony died in, in 1836. And in 1845, my third great grandfather um, built the historic Green Twachman House at 30 Round Hill Road. Big shout out to John Nelson, um, who might be in the room. And uh, we, we now know that uh, uh, John Twachman, of course, further made improvements on that. Next slide. Uh, the Lion Green mem Merits were members of Second Congregational Church in the 1840s, and many are buried in the historic Lot 23 in Union Cemetery. Uh, they were also members of the Colored Mission of Sandwich Church. Um, they, in addition, they are buried in uh, Putnam Cemetery, the historic African American Cemetery in Rye, New York, the Hetty Burial Ground, in, which borders Austin and Yorktown and Newcastle, and many other historic uh, uh, cemeteries in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut. Many served in the 29th Connecticut Colored Troops, the 103rd and 54th Regiments during the Civil War and all served, of course, on the right side of history. They volunteered to um, free their fellow um, African-Americans who were um, still enslaved as volunteers. And in 1882, Little Bethel AME Church, the first African-American church in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, was founded by some of our Lion Green Merits. Next slide. Decline of Hangroup. Nothing says gentrification like the Rock, Rockefellers moving in. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Um, the African-American community of Hangroot gets gentrified out of Hangroot um, by the dual process of white ethnic immigration. We're talking immigrants from Ireland, Scotland, Italy, England. Um, they moved in and they took so the jobs that you know, the Lion Green Merits and other people of color had traditionally uh, taken. And uh, so you see the, a bunch of people moving south into Westchester, into New Jersey, into New York City, or moving north into Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. So um, some of us are still living around Greenwich, very close to the burial ground, I must say. But um, many of us still live in, in New England uh, and the mid-Atlantic states, of course. Next slide. Okay, we're gonna discuss some of the residents of Hangroot and then the surrounding communities because Hangroot did not exist as an early um, African and native community by itself. Again, as I earlier explained, there were other communities of color within the tri-state area that had a relationship to Hangroot. Uh, next slide. Now, people, uh, some people might have heard um, this talk before, and sorry for the repetition, but hey, I, I added some more people for for you to get to learn. So, we have uh, Hardy Indian. Uh, Born in 1810, circa, we're not really sure. All we can go on is the age that was recorded in the 1850 um, census, and he died 1861. He's a possible descendant of a John Howday Indian who fought in the French and Indian War, 1775 to 1776. Uh, Hardy Indian was definitely. Um, part of the, his ancestors, part of the Wappinger Federation, Munsee Nation. We do see a John Indian is listed in the 1820 Greenwich census. And one other person who might be Hardy Indian's father. He worked for the Houston family and uh, go to the next slide. So I hope that it's a little bit larger. Okay, this is a clipping from the Stanford Advocate, uh, September 22nd. 1945. The reason why I want to discuss this is we know from our cousin Christine Varner that um, 
Hardy Indian worked for the Houston family up on Round Hill Road. And um, he, you know, uh, dressed in, in traditional um, indigenous clothing. Um, according to this article, he scared the little children. Um, Chris uh, mentioned that her mother and her grandmother used to uh, talk about him, used to take her not only to the colored cemetery to pay her respects by um, leaving flowers there, but also to his burial site, which is still up on Round Hill Road. And we hope that uh, a marker will be placed there. Um, but it's interesting because there's uh, uh, this, this romanticization of, in this portrait of him that's written where he lives in a cave, behind Horse Neck Brook when Chris's oral history um, basically states that he lived on Houston property in one of their bonds. They used to bring the doctor in to take care of him when he was sick. Um, he was a basket maker. Uh, he, uh, she particularly remembers that one of her, I think her second great grandfather uh, dressed him up in white man's clothes and had a photograph taken of him. And um, that photograph hung for many years and many generations in their homestead. And it was given to the Bruce Museum along with other indigenous items for, they used to have an Indian collection room, um, which they later sold all of that, you know, all those items. So that photograph has been lost, but she, she uh, still has some items um, that hopefully will end up at the Historical Society. Um, next slide. Okay, Jack Green, he's a new one. Jack Green, uh, and we're researching uh, this line. We are about 95 to plus percent certain that he is Anthony Green's older brother along with Samson Green. He was born in 1761 and died in 1830. He is a black patriot. He is a forgotten patriot. So we want to make sure people realize that, um, yeah, some of us have been here since the beginning and, and fought for this country. Uh, he's buried in Stony Hill Cemetery. Um, Jack lived in the area back then called the hills. Um, one of the slides that I, I did include is that I normally discuss boundaries. Byram, we have to remember, uh, was part of New Amsterdam. At times it was called Saw Pits, East Port Chester, and Rye. So when you're doing genealogical research, you, have, you can't look at borders today as being fixed throughout time. They weren't. So you, if you're gonna look and research Greenwich and Byram, you have to look at Rye, you have to look at Port Chester and East Port Chester. You have to expand the map and go back to what the borders were in a particular time period that your ancestors live. So the hills is a known location of our ancestors for generations, both our Banks ancestors and the Green ancestors. Um, we see uh, a Samson Green in Greenwich, who's the son of this Samson that is buried with um, Jack. We know that uh, Alan, and John and Thomas are names that are found throughout our green line. And that is very standard of colonial families is to name your children after not only your parents, but after your siblings. Um, and he was a property owner in Westchester at the time. Um, we are actively um, trying to track down uh, his children and their descendants right now. So uh, this uh, more expanded section of Jack Green will be in my book. Next slide. Ali African, mentioned him early. Ali is probably Ali 
and in the um, Greenwich census records, that name is spelled so many different ways. He was born circa 1793. Sometimes they have him in at 70, 1785. We don't know actually when he was born, but he died in 1879, clearly a Muslim. He was married to Rachel. Uh, we haven't found any children connected to, to both of them. And um, in an earlier presentation uh, last week, I said he, he was, wasn't freed until 1840. It was 1820. Um, There's some indications where in some newspaper articles, they, they hinted that because he was so polite that he must have had royal uh, roots. Uh, we don't know that. Um, he did own two parcels of land that totaled 25 acres, and he was the richest person of African descent in Greenwich um, in 1850. But what happens to him uh, when both uh, he and Rachel get older is that a conservator was appointed to handle his affairs and in, 18, in 1878. And what this person did, and we believe it's most likely um, that he was enslaved, formerly enslaved by uh, uh, Reynolds. Uh, they put him in the poorhouse and sold his land. Yeah, next slide. And we'll leave it right there. Then we have Peter John Lee, a person who is intimately connected to the Thomas J. Lyon house, the oldest um, house in, in Greenwich. Uh, and a uh, big shout out to the Greenwich Preservation Trust and, and Joe Conboy. But he arrived in Greenwich in the late 1820s, sometimes in the eight, 1820s. We don't know when, but it's basically around the same time that my third great grandmother, um, Mary Johnson, uh, arrived from Virginia. Likewise, William Grimes, another one of my cousins on the Grimes side from Virginia, also arrived. So Greenwich was a, a, a stop on the Underground Railroad earlier. And the people who lived in Greenwich were early abolitionists before Sojourner, Frederick, and Harriet came on the scene. And I, I want to say that both Greenwich has a history of uh, both um, African Native and white abolitionists. Big shout out to Jeffrey Bingham Mead's uh, uh, ancestor, Reverend Jonas Mead. And big shout out to our lion abolitionists, both Seth and Gilbert and Benjamin. Um, he was a free black who worked for Seth Lyon, who was uh, a lawyer, and Gilbert Lyon. And um, Gilbert and Seth actually also um, sold uh, produce and many things. Um, uh, Byron Bluestone uh, as well. And he was working for them and he was enticed to go over the Byron Bridge. And I know a lot of people, that bridge doesn't take that long to walk over, but he was enticed by another person of African descent who was paid off by the infamous kidnapping club. And um, he was re-enslaved in Virginia. And though Seth and Gilbert um, advocated to no avail did they bring him back. Uh, he escaped a second time and like the first time he knew who to run to and that was David Ruggles, um, you know, a man who's dear and near to my heart. Uh, David Ruggles uh, was born in Connecticut, but he also uh, was an underground railroad station master and he was can I say simply badass? He was. He founded the um, committee uh, uh, for vigilance and they actually operated outside of the uh, South Street Port C area. And they, as, as ships would come in uh, to New York, which New York was the second largest trading port outside of Charleston at the time, they would, they would rescue people and, and ferry them to freedom. He escapes a second time and goes to, ends up in Canada where we lost track of him. And um, when I think of my ancestors, they knew Peter John Lee. 
Um, Jack Houston, in, in, when he was living with Simeon, Simeon's house was, was very close to the Byron Bridge from maps. So at any point when you're talking about, um, you know, the fear that that free, formerly free and enslaved people had, it was a real fear. That fear escalates as you get closer to 1850 with the fugitive slave law is enacted and anybody can, any free person can, can be uh, kidnapped and sold South. We know from our Freeman line out of New York City and um, my, my uh, fourth great grandmother tune, her father was a black patriot as well. Uh, one of his grandchildren happened to be working at the dock in South Street Seaport and uh, someone asked to see his papers. And he showed him, they ripped him up and kidnapped him and he was sold into slavery in North Carolina. Um, it's a free and it's, 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 it's a real concern that these folks have. And it's evidence when I look at my third great grandmother, Mary Johnson Green, when her children, two or three of her sons get married, they give her totally different surnames, maiden names, I should say. Why? To disclose and not to disclose who she is. And you see that often everywhere. If you look at the abolitionist newspapers, they, they will give you initials of people because they're hiding who they are for fear of being identified as such. Um, next slide. Lucinda Ross Green. Uh, Lucinda was Solomon Green's uh, wife, that's my third great uncle. She was born in 1815 in Windsor, Connecticut, which is outside of Hartford. And she died in Greenwich in 1886. She's buried in lot uh, 23 of Union Cemetery. I, uh, her mother was Nancy Fletcher and her father was Henry Ross. Go to the next slide because um, this is a great document because if you look where the birthplaces of her father and mother it simply says South as a slave. Hartford and New Haven were the two largest uh, uh, slave ports in Connecticut. Um, Greenwich didn't even come close. Next slide. Horace Watson. Um, that picture is from the Library of Congress. It's of the 29th Connecticut colored troops. He is a hangroot hero. He was one of 18 uh, hangroot heroes who fought and one of the few uh, who actually died. Uh, he was born in New York and married to Sally Ann Peck, the daughter of George and Hulda Peck. And, and uh, she is uh, uh, a Jeffrey Felmetta descendant. We'll discuss who he is in a minute. Uh, he was a basketball maker, a day laborer, a farm hand. He was a member of the colored mission of Stanwich Church and he served and, and uh, died in Beaufort, South Carolina. Next slide. William Peterson. Now I'm not gonna go into detail about William Peterson because a lot of this will be in the book, but here's the tea. William Peterson was married to Emily Briggs, the daughter of Philip Briggs and Charity Knapp of Round Hill Road. We have an inkling that Philip Briggs um, was probably of European descent um, because Emily is listed in, in certain records as black, as white, whatever. We don't know too much about Philip Briggs, but we do know there, there was a European Philip Briggs uh, who was living in that area. Uh, Knapp, of course, is a name that is well known in Greenwich and, and intimately linked to the Houstons, the, the Lions, the Merritts, and everybody else. William was born in New York, although some uh, census records state that he was born in uh, the West Indies. We don't know. But what we do know from both DNA, oral history, and a lot of other evidence we've been documenting over the past um, five to 10 years was that he was the older brother of Harriet Peterson who married Howley Green, the Underground Railroad Station Masters in Peekskill. He was, uh, they were among the founding members of Sandwich Church. They were the parents of Robert Peterson, USCT, 29th Connecticut Colored Troops, 
and the daughter of Emily, who was married to my uh, second great uncle, the Reverend Thomas Green. Next slide. Jeffrey Falmetta. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about Jeffrey Falmetta, only because I know that my lion cousin, Dennis Richmond, if you had, some of you might have read the huge um, New York Times um, article that was published uh, the last Sunday in February. Uh, Dennis is researching the Falmetta line. He is a direct descendant. Um, I, we also, uh, in the past year, found two other young uh, Felmetta um, cousins, uh, Ashley Freeland and Olivia, uh, who are also descendants of, of Jeffrey Felmetta, and they're also doing a lot of research. So I, I, I'm leaving it to the three of them. But he is among the earliest of, of uh, free people in Greenwich, along with Whitman Merritt, and my cousin, uh, our cousin Bill Merritt is a descendant of Whitman Merritt who was freed as early as uh, 1730. He was born in 1763 in Connecticut. Uh, he died in 1832. He was Afro-Indigenous Mohawk descent. His descendants married into a lot of lines. Again, this is endogamy. They married into our Freeman line out of Stamford and our Lion Green Merit lines, both in Connecticut and New York. He acquired substantial um, wealth and held um, the mortgage, we know, thanks to Holly Kilpatrick, a descendant of Salem Mead. Um, he actually held the mortgage to Salem Mead's house for generations. Um, some indications he may have been a stone mason. Um, we've traced him to Black Rock, which was a port in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, I am still interested in the, the how Jeffrey accumulated his wealth. We know that Jeffrey Bingham Mead um, has written um, a blog post on uh, uh, the Felmetta family, and that name is spelled so many different ways. Um, but Jeffrey had identified at least 25 land records at Greenwich Town Hall, the clerk's office. And I believe that um, both Dennis, Ashley, and Olivia, I should have said her last name, Olivia Clark, um, will be doing the research on their Felmetta line. And I'll be happy to uh, uh, read it. Uh, next slide. Okay. Now, I'm not sharing all the tea on this one because there's a whole lot of tea. Caesar Allah is the father of Ichabod Purdy. Now, in a previous presentation, I discussed how Ichabod Purdy lived to be almost 100 years old. He was well known in Greenwich um, and people remembered him fondly. Now, one of the first thing I want to discuss is what's in a name, because when you look at Ichabod Purdy's uh, record in census, in the census, he's Ichabod Purdy, he's Ichabod Lear, he's Ichabod, and we were like, wait a minute. So we were, we dug deeper and his father is very interesting. Um, turns out his father's name was Caesar Alar. Now Caesar is spelled many different ways as is Alar. Um, and so this is the, Caesar would be the generation right after the Revolutionary War. And I see this frequently among a lot of my ancestors in the Northeast, where I can trace their ancestry back either to uh, Dutch Reformed church records, where, where uh, because one parent was owned by one enslaver and another parent was owned by another enslaver, some of the kids took the name of that one versus the other one. Some may have taken the name of an enslaver that they worked with and that they had a great relationship with. So, you know, when you're doing enslaved ancestor research, you, you have to keep an eye and an ear open for everything, all the possibilities, no stone unturned, because a lot of folks get caught up if they find a name on a census record and they think that that is the name. That has to be the name. 
And it doesn't necessarily have to be the name. You have to go back. Again, I say this all the time. Don't believe Henry Louis Gates hype. You can look at a slave census or a slave schedule and see the name and the sex and say, that's my ancestor. You can't do that. There are ways of looking for corresponding evidence beyond slave schedules, beyond the census. I know we first run to the census, but the census record is notoriously wrong. So you have to look for corresponding documentation, whether it is church records, tax records, you have to go, um, could be old books looking, you have to follow the trail and be open to the possibilities. And so we were able to trace Caesar Allaire. Um, and again, I'm spelling it differently there because it's spelled a lot of different ways. He was born in New York, most likely Putnam County, maybe even in Phillipstown. Uh, and he was a black patriot. Well, right now there's many Caesars listed as black patriots, but we do know it's either him or his father who was a black patriot. He was married to a woman named Sibby and they had a bunch of children. They had Ichabob, Jesse, Parmelia, Mary, Henry, Christina, Caesar, and Abraham. He was emancipated in 1813 um, by Charles McEvers, whose ancestor, James McEvers, a merchant originally from Boston, but ends up in New York City being one of the founders of Wall Street. And you can Google James McEvers, Wall Street, and you will see that the... Um, all the tea there. Now, uh, in his will, he distributed, and I forgot to put, I'm going to put the current dollar amount, $748.38. That's what it was valued in 1830. Today, that would have been $19,317.57. That was a lot of money for a formerly enslaved person. And he distributed it to his heirs. And um, the property was owned in New Rochelle, about 20 acres. And he also owned property in Phillipstown, New York. And the Allaire Purdy family intermarried with our Lion Green Merritts, our Thompsons, and our Peterson ancestors. Again, in Dogamy, you find the Allaires not all, all over Westchester in Peekskill, in Greenwich, in, in Westchester, all over. So again, it's this endogamy that we see. And I know from one of the records in the colored newspaper articles in the Colored American, you see Howley Green um, uh, uh, wanted to form a colored school with George Washington Purdy and James C. Purdy. Again, early African and native endogamy. And I will say this in a personal correspondence with Phillipsburg Manor, and uh, they have documentation, the will of Adolf Phillips, that when his family fled uh, because their property was to be seized by the Patriots, the good guys, um, they ended up taking a Caesar and, and leaving <clears throat> him and uh, I believe it was uh, Westchester where he became a ward of the town and they lost track of him and they figured that he died after 1880. What we're further researching is, is this Caesar who was emancipated in 1813, that Caesar. And it could be that he might have moved elsewhere with Charles McEvers. So again, hopefully I'll have more for the book. Uh, Next slide. Okay, Lazarus Hetty family. Now, Lazarus is the son of Thomas Hayden, and that's Hayden is spelled differently. And like our lion ancestors who were patriots, Thomas Hayden was a patriot. He was he was from Scarsdale. He died in 17, um, I should have said 61. Uh, he emancipated his seven children whom he had with his Negro wench Rose. Uh, his will is very interesting because it's five pages, three pages is devoted to his Negro wench Rose and their seven kids 
who he emancipated, provided for their education and gave them an inheritance. They then become Westchester's uh, first free fa uh, black family. Um, the Hetty family intermarried with our Thompson Green line and Lazarus actually worked uh, for Benjamin Lyons of White Plains. And uh, just so you see how extra I am, when I'm going through historical newspaper clippings and I, when I, I told this story, the first time I ever stepped and, and got the requisite tour as a descendant, a Lion Green Merritt descendant, um, in the Thomas uh, J. Lyon house, I walked out and I looked at Joe Conboy and I said, you can't tell me they, they weren't doing abolitionist activities. And I was kept pestering her and she was so funny. She's like, I'm like, how come you don't know? And she's like, looks at me and she's like, Tracy, no one's asked these questions. I was like, bet, bet, bet. So when I saw that it mentioned Benjamin um, Lyon, who was a first cousin to Seth and Gilbert and talked about him being a wig. And, and I, I was so excited. So I was like, yes. Okay, next slide. <laughs> All right, we're gonna talk about the colored cemetery, make this quick. So I know people have questions. Next slide. Okay, so this is the colored cemetery today. Right above, you'll see the lion in the Byron Cemetery again. There was no such thing as the Byram African American Cemetery. The Colored Cemetery was always a part of the Byram Cemetery. Um, next slide. This was the Colored Cemetery before the desecration. And I wanna say, uh, see that road on the upper right? We have a lot of friends on that road who have taken upon themselves to be caretakers of all three cemeteries. Next slide. Okay, so this is the plaque language that I worked on with um, Ann Young, um, an uh, archivist, and also with my cousin, Norm Davis, Lion descendant. And simply, um, we know two updates that within the next year, they've budgeted for the wall. We have um, an undisclosed donor who will be paying for the boulder with a plaque. And we worked on this plaque language and it was important that my family have a voice and that our voice be heard and that we be erased no more. So it will state, the Colored Cemetery serves as a tribute to the Na African and Native American origins of Greenwich and an enduring hope to those of mixed blood. As more evidence is revealed, the lives of the Lion Green Merritt family, some of whom are buried here, will continue to disclose stories of slavery, faithfulness, and a commitment towards justice. Can I get an amen? Amen. The other thing I wanna say, um, we have sort of an update that where uh, Christopher Shields um, and I are, and Andrea are tracking down, uh, thanks to uh, Nancy, a docent of the Greenwich Historical Society. She was in touch with a friend of hers who happened to remember that um, her mother remembered that uh, when the heating tank, that if you, can you go back to the first picture of the Colored Cemetery? Um, do you see the three, if you can point to the three windows? Uh, on the side of the house, right, like five feet from there is the low wall that is actually the border to the Stewart's property. I, and I believe someone said that they might already have a, a buyer. But when in the archaeological survey and in the, their um, lawsuit, they mentioned that they paid for ground pen penetrating radar and that they found a heating tank. Well, this person remembers her mother mentioning that when the heating tank was put in, that they had to call the coroner who was based in Hartford because they found human remains. I contacted the coroner who quickly put me over to the state library. I, I'm working with the librarian. We're trying to follow up um, on this bit of evidence. I don't doubt it. I've never doubted my ancestors were buried there. I never doubted the truth that our Lyon uh, cousins, Henry Lyon standing up and others back in the 1890s when Waterman tried to desecrate the cemetery in the same way. I never doubted that. 
not for a second, not for a minute or a nanosecond. Okay, so I will say this, and could we go back uh, forward? Keep going forward. I will say this. Um, court documents as genealogical documents. Okay, they exist forever. So when those who shall not be named desecrated the cemetery and put it in a court document and said, the two cemeteries up there are legit, but this one right here and this one right here isn't legit because of this. That's a court document. So they can't say that they aren't racist. That was a racist act that is now on the historic record that that's what they did when they did it. Um, as I told you, uh, uh, a big thank you goes out to our friends in the neighborhood, especially Alex and Matt uh, Pope and their, uh, their families, especially Alex's daughter. She, she's very photogenic in these pictures. Benita Meta, Meta and other members of the Friends of the Old Burial Ground in Byron Shore Road. We have a Facebook group. I encourage everybody in the neighborhood, don't be shy. Don't talk about it. Join this group and um, let's uh, uh, have more community involvement. Uh, next slide. And why hang root in the colored cemeteries matter. Again, enslaved and free people of color have been and always have been and still are an intrinsic part of Greenwich history. Some were consummate forgotten patriots who deserve to be remembered as such, just like any other Greenwich and, and any other Westchester patriot. These folks' names should be said and forgotten no more. As I said earlier, they were just like everybody else and shouldn't be erased from history. Hang Root has to be remembered as a place of refuge for self-emancipated people like my third great grandmother, Mary Johnson Green, Peter John Lee, and my uh, third cousin seven times removed, William Grimes. Um, and I have to do a shout out to my uh, two of my cousins, um, Regina Mason, an ancestor of William Grimes, and Timothy Caesar, who married into our, um, who is related to the Grimes and Catherine Williams uh, as well. And Hangar citizens were always part of the, the, the Underground Railroad throughout the 1800s, um, maybe even as early as the late 1700s. And I've been documented that and documented that. And um, hopefully my book will uh, make a, a clear link between all of the issues I discussed today. Next slide. Okay, now we can go to the chat room. Sorry, I'm just gonna unmute, and I know we have some okay, questions. I have to look at the chat. Yeah, I'm gonna look at the chat. Okay. I don't see anything in the chat, do I? Um, so uh, there are a few questions. That okay. Came in. Uh, there was a clarification oh, question. Um, okay. The location of the hills you mentioned, sort of a. Uh huh. Technically, today that would be in the Harrison section. Technically, however, historically, it, it that Hills region could have gone up into Byram as well. It, it's 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 uh, it's hard to say, but today it's located in Harrison. And then um, another question about the location of the Sandwich Church Colored Mission. Um, is that Sandwich Church that's on Taconic Road? Is that? The, the, that's the Sandwich Church where, where I actually gave a talk there. I can't see all the questions for some reason. Um, that I, I have um, several people at Sandwich Church who are researching that because we believe the Colored Mission was affiliated with the um, the church, the larger church in uh, Stamford. However, there at that particular time, the records could be at Stanwich Church. So that's, we believe it's that church. Um, so we're still following up with that. Um, Heather asks, I mean, she's only seen three pictures of Hangroot and she was wondering if more exist. Well, well, you know, they very might, well, we're like again, we're we're still trying to track down the descendants. When when our people migrated out of Greenwich, 
a lot of the people who have photos. Now I know Dennis Richmond has photos from his line. I don't know how far back besides that Lakeland, uh, Lake Avenue picture he has, but I'm certain there are other pictures that, that exist that we're still trying to track down. I mean, of course we have family pictures as well. And I will say it, pictures pop up in some of the strangest places and unexpected times. So I, I'm sorry there. there's yeah, more out there. <laughs> um, and just a reminder, if anyone does have a question, they're being submitted through Q&A. So um, it's different than chat. So you'll look at the bottom, you'll see the Q&A um, option. Mm -hmm. The uh, next question comes from Bart and um, this is wondering if you have family reunions and does everyone get together? Um, we need to have a big, big family reunion. Some of us have more localized family reunions and, and have reunions like when I spoke at Rutgers, we had a whole crowd there, but we have to plan a big, big one. Um, again, it's location, pandemic, whatever, but I'm certain when Andrea and I have a book come out, we're, we're gonna have that family reunion. Um, and so we have another question that's coming in um, from Aquila. The, about the, um, the connection between the black community in Bedford on the Aspatong and Hook. Um, and she said, we have some evidence pointing to that area in Bedford as being set aside for enslaved people, but still looking for more documents. Well, well the, the funny thing about Bedford is that um, Jeffrey Falmetta, uh, he was uh, free during the Battle of Yorktown. And where did he like go to? But Bedford. So, mm -hmm. There's that information out there. And actually that um, newspaper article mentions him going to Bedford. So I'm certain that there, there are a bunch of Jeffrey's kids were there. And when I look at the Falmetta family, they're all over, as, as were the Greens and the Purdies, all over Westchester, all over. And so when people like for Ichabob and for uh, the Greens and for Falmetta, everybody talks about, oh, they were well known. Yeah, because they were all over. And and Ichabod was a coachman. Um, so he was going just like my Thomas Thompson, going from New York up to Albany and and making those ties. Mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Um Peter asks that the Close family had a strong connection to the Round Hill Club and was wondering if um, Closes were part of the effort to buy out residents of Hangroot. I, I don't know yet. All I know is some of our families, um, uh, when I say most of the gentrification came when the Rockefellers moved in. And it wasn't just them displacing people of color, it was them <laughs> displacing other poorer residents of that area. Um, I know that our, our, some of our ancestors did work for the close family, but again, that, that's research that still has to be done. But, but the primary exodus that we have is, is of gentrification is when the Rockefellers moved in. And again, the massive, massive migration of white ethnics coming in and, um, and then pushing these folks out. Jonathan asks, um, my house is off sandwich and has a root cellar structure. Um, I feel like sometimes it's, it's wires cat rock. And do you know anything about those cemeteries? Um, and Which ones? I'll say thank you. I guess the cemeteries um, that are on cat rock. I, I, I don't, I don't. Mm -hmm. Chris might, yeah. Um. Um, Siobhan's asking, um, how receptive has the town of Greenwich been to acknowledging this history? Very, very receptive. I think the I, I, I think once you identify it, I, I don't think when I when I when I um, actually my my answer to because I, I I only know one way to be epic when when root when when standing up for my ancestors when um, they did the lawsuit, I responded with a three hundred page document of history facts, because I deal with facts. So, and since that time, um, like I said, it, you know, uh, you have to write it down and present it. And, and when we finish this book, it's 20 plus years of research. And 
Um, I didn't want a book. People always ask me when I, when am I going to put out a book? And I, and I, you know, hesitate because I wanted a book that could stand on its own. I don't want any issues. Uh, if it, you know, I want it to stand with the best of books and, and be uh, remembered for that. I don't want it, have it, it put shoddy work out there and everybody's questioning it. No, I want it facts. I want it documents. And it takes time to, to locate these documents. Um, doing archival research is not easy. And I, I always talk about this. Um, I, for instance, last week I went to the his, New York Historical Society and I have a whole list of, of items I wanna see. And literally turning page by page and, and went away and was like, blah. And then I, on the way home, Andrea calls me, Teresa, you know what I found? And it's like, okay, why didn't you, couldn't you find it before? And I wouldn't have to waste that trip and, and look through that. And, and so I was supposed to go back a second day and I canceled that out because I, I knew I couldn't find what I was looking for there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we do is in what we've been finding is literally uh, going through old history books, um, going through the archives. Like we can't get into uh, Friendish Town Hall yet. I think that's gonna be a little bit crowded when we go back. Um, but there are stories are out there, it takes time. And again, we just uh, found all this wonderful information on Caesar Alar. There's the Putnam Historical Society. There, you know, there's just, you just keep going down the trail. And I'm just so happy that uh, because of the Black Lives uh, Movement, there are actually a lot of historical societies, not only the Greenwich Historical Society and the Rye Historical Society, but historical societies throughout the country, throughout Westchester, who are going back and, and reevaluating what they actually have in their collections. Uh, because there are gold mines out there. People just have not been looking for it. And most of the time, it isn't anything nefarious. It's just that they never knew. So it's our job as descendants to write our ancestors back into history and call attention to, to what they've done and who they were and how they managed to survive. And I also have been part of a couple of conversations with other historical societies about how we can go back into our collection mm -hmm. and sort of reevaluate the metadata and identifiers to make it easier for researchers to find, you know, mm -hmm. you know, documents and things on the topic. Um, and this leads us to Diane's question is, when is your book coming out? Well, well, I'm, 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 I'm writing it. <laughs> I've had some health issues in the past couple of years. So I'm, I'm sitting down writing it and whenever I get ready to write something else comes in. So the biggest find we just had was, and I, I promised this to my, my grandfather's first cousin, Yvonne, she passed away about two years ago, as did our beloved cousin, um, uh, Helen, but Yvonne for years remembered the oral history that we had black patriots in the family. She heard that and she was so insistent. And before she passed away, we found um, our cousin Anna's, uh, uh, one of her ancestors was a black patriot. And I was able to share that with her but I keep thinking when we found Samuel, I, I have to wait to get the information. And I'm, I'm actually putting together my own DAR um, file and it will be out of the Manhattan chapter, AKA the Peter Minuet chapter. Um, and to be able to uh, uh, have that application approved in a place that we know our ancestors have always been, native ancestors always been here, and that our ancestors uh, have, from Africa have a 400 year history here. Uh, I, you know, th that's what we've been looking for. Um, on Toon's line, we descend not only from the first enslaved uh, people from Madagascar in the 16, mid 1600s, but some of the first Afro Dutch who came over as Spanish Negroes uh, captured uh, in the 1620s. So um, yeah, so yeah, so soon, within the next hopefully uh, year or two before that, not too longer. 
but I'll be working on, I'm working on some articles. So I hope to have the articles published before that. Mm -hmm. Look, always looking forward to seeing your research. Um, I do want to address someone asked the uh, if we could put the PowerPoint in the chat for download. I don't want to take too much time to figure that out right now because I'd have to play around with my computer. Um, but we do have the mailing list. So I will send out the handouts that um, Teresa mentioned earlier, as well as the PowerPoint for download to download to uh, the email list, and we'll have that out um, tomorrow. I'll try and get that out to everyone. So um, my apologies that I can't do it right now. I just don't want to take too much time to try and figure it out. Um, Wendy asks, where do you find most of your sources? Well, again, you're, you're, it could be old. Sometimes it's looking at Google Books. Um, I did, it's so funny because I did a talk on uh, at the Greenwich uh, Library on, on newspapers and just sources. So it could be, um, free places like Internet Archives to, to Hathi Trust to um, Google Books. Uh, you're, you're talking about actual going to the archives in person because not everything is online. So uh, um, it could be newspaper articles are a gold mine. Um, I do a lot of archival research. So when I go there, it's not, it's looking at books, looking at manuscripts, it's looking at what's in the actual vertical files. And again, um, there's a lot of stuff that's online through family search and their index and unindexed records. Some of their uh, unindexed records are available online. So I do a lot of, you know, that level online research because of the pandemic, but the, uh, but you can't be, you know, um, actually going to historical societies and seeing the documents live. Now, but if you can't do that, you, there, there are ways of online, but don't underestimate history books because a lot of times there are references there. I can't tell you how many times um, you see, oh, wait a minute, I know that person. Oh, I didn't know this. And it comes in. Mm -hmm. um, Tracy is asking yep. about Caesar um, and I guess, I think I know which Tracy this is. It's good to see you, Tracy. Um, and uh, every year for their third grade field trip, they go to Phillipsburg Manor and they have an interpreter who's being Caesar. Um, at, oh yeah, well, see, that's that what I'm looking at now. Wondering if that's the same well, well, that's what I said. We're researching that now because it just mm -hmm. seems coincidence that they lose track of him in 1810. And then this person is emancipated in 1813. So I think that Caesar in Phillipsburg is either Ichabod's father or his grandfather. Because when you go to the Forgotten Patriots, there's like for New York, because it would have been in New York, um, there are like six or seven Caesars with no last name. So again, this is the issue where we have to go back and look for, so I'm gonna have to go back and 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 somehow explore Charles McEver's line to see if what I can find. Yeah. But there's a possibility it's what he's definitely there. And the fact that he's in Phillips town or, you know, that's Phillips. Yeah, it's right there, Putnam County. And when you say Putnam County, I think of course the Phillips and I think Malagasy roots because he was the, one of the major enslavers who brought in people from Madagascar. And, and I wanna, when I speak of Malagasy roots, um, I've seen pictures of, of uh, Harriet Peterson and I can certainly say, I know she had Malagasy roots. <laughs> it's clear when you see it. So, it, it, and uh, you consider that the um, Toons line was enslaved for 200 years that we know of by one Dutch family. Again, when you talk Northern slavery, you're not talking large plantation slavery, you're talking maybe one or two people. In Greenwich, the maximum amount of enslaved people were owned by the Bush and Houston family. They were seven and eight, but most of your um, enslavers had only one to two. And, and so you're not talking a lot. And these people, uh, wherever they migrated, like we, we have traced our Timbrook line to Cornelius Tembrook who left um, Orange County and migrated to Middlesex County, New Jersey and right before the Revolutionary War. 
you see our line anywhere from Albany down to Southern New Jersey into Pennsylvania and Delaware. So um, yeah, it's, it's exciting to see that connection um, that we have. Okay, we do have a few more questions. Yeah. Um, Nan is asking, um, do you know what the demographics, the numbers of residents in Hangroot were when the Rockefellers? Um, it was I, I, it was going down. They they moved in 1880, so that numbers in my blog post. I'm going to refer you back to my blog post on Hangroot, where I go through each census record with the amounts, and that's on both of the handouts because you see a decline when they start moving in in the late 1870s. That's when you see the the, the decline. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Bard is asking about um, any record of artistic activities and, and what kind of records, um, but I think that might be getting more into Twachman. I'm not sure if there's any artistic um, connections. Okay. Um, so, so Bart, I will refer you to um, the Cost Cup Art Colony and John Twachman mm -hmm. um, and in the Historical Society has lots of information about him. Um, an actual upcoming exhibition. I'm sorry for the shameless plug in the fall. Um, so, <laughs> I, I've, uh, heard, about is, the um, I've heard about the leather but, man. I've heard about the leather man. Oh, and uh, oh, um, free. So there's plenty about artistic, but it, it is a little later than than the time we're discussing today. Um, and then you wanted to address the the leatherman question. Oh, oh, oh! I, I I've read about him. Um, mm -hmm. I believe Robert Machan's book uh, has a lot about him. So I, I've heard of him. Um, and uh, are the oral histories of any of your, I haven't done the oral history project, but I need to. So someone, I know, I know Anna could point me in the right direction, but <laughs> I think my blog posts also stand for that. Mm -hmm. And I know well, they have If you want to go down, we, yes, we can definitely yeah. uh, finish the oral history project. Um, and let's see. Oh, well, Jonathan's uh, also. Could you hold on for one phone. minute? Sorry. Could you just hold on for one minute? That's a package. <laughs> okay. Um. So, so Nan, your follow-up question: um, the census numbers regarding um, the number of people living in Hangroot are sort of documented on a blog that uh, Teresa upkeeps the. Um, Pardon me. It's it's radiant roots in and Boracog branches. Um, I will put that will be in the hangout handout that I will distribute tomorrow. It'll have all of that that information, so you can go there um, and reference the census numbers as to how many people were living in Hangroot when the Rockefellers moved in. Um, sorry about that. No problem. Okay, what's the next question? I think we have one more question. Okay. Um, and that is to whom oh. was the Scrooge collection sold and why? Do you know anything about those materials? Um, which one was that? So uh, it was the picture of... Um... Oh, the, oh, 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 we don't know. We're trying to follow up. We have no idea. I don't even think they know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, it, it, we have no idea. We have no idea. Um, uh, I know Chris had uh, tried to follow up with it. Um, we have no idea. So we're looking into that because it's such a shame. Um, you know, that was a whole lot of history, um, but we're looking into that. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, what did, what is Nan Levy's thing? I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I addressed that as oh, okay. the way, just the clarification of, of where to find the information okay. about the um, sort of the demographics of numbers of people living in Hangroot when the Rockefellers moved in. Uh, I refer, if you want to know um, by the, uh, uh, regarding the Rockefellers, you can read my blog post um, on Hangroot. I, I detail that. Um, and yeah, I detail that. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, I wanna say thank you again so much for coming to talk. Um, every time you come, there's, there's more information. I feel like there's also more questions um, and more threads that you're trying to track down. So uh, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us um, tonight. And I look forward to your books and, and everything else that you discover. Thank you so much. And thank it's you- It's always a pleasure. Me. Four years later, and, and I'm, we're still here, Anna. <laughs> yes. yes, we are. All right, have a good night. You too. Bye.